Hello, everybody, and welcome to Nature Drawing. Today's workshop is uh, one of our samples of what we do at Hike and Draw. We were a in-person guiding service that became um, a, a drawing uh, program online as well. And I wanted to put this together as a way to not only introduce what we do as a company, but also to give you a couple of tools for you to take on your next hike or your next, uh, your next jaunt out into nature. So my name is James Sisti. I'm a professional artist and a wilderness guide. Today, I have the privilege of being your instructor. We have a pretty packed agenda today. But before we get into our exercises, we're going to discuss a few things, such as what are our goals? What is nature drawing? What kind of materials should we be using? And how we can get started uh, in cultivating our own nature drawing practice. So essentially, the goal of nature drawing isn't just about making nice pictures, um, although that's part of it. The goal of nature drawing is to form a deeper, more intimate con connection with nature. You know, we have so many distractions in our modern day that, you know, sort of take away from the experience of being outdoors. And part of the process of drawing that allows you to tune more, tune into nature better is the fact that it essentially forces you to slow down and notice things that you would otherwise not notice. And it's a great opportunity also to document your experiences so you can create these nice um, artistic renderings or these representations of your time out in nature. And you can share those things with other people as well. It's a great habit and it's something that the more you do, the better you get and it feeds into itself quite nicely. So when I talk about artist's field kit, let's assume that we're all going on a hike together. Obviously everything weighs, uh, you know, you don't wanna, everything has a weight to it. So you don't wanna bring too much materials with you. Uh, you wanna bring just the right amount. So for me, my kit consists of a bare minimum of a sketchbook, a pencil, and a pen. And I know those are the things that I'm absolutely going to use. These are also things that are accessible. Um, for folks who wanna add other things, like if you're interested in doing watercolor paintings or bringing colored pencils or even oil paints, things like that, those are all things that you add on to your baseline kit. So in order to get started, all we need is a drawing surface, like a sketchbook or a piece of paper, a pencil or a pen, and that's it. So it's a very easy hobby to get started in. Uh, and then everything else is, is modularized after that. Okay, so I encourage people to consider an area of nature that they find particularly interesting. For some of us, that's birds or flowering plants. People are into things like fossils and insects and all other kinds of uh, interesting subject matter. The idea of tuning into something that interests you particularly is it's to make it attractive. It's to make it something that you want to do, that you look forward to doing. And that also helps you to be consistent with forming your habit and uh, building your skill set around that interest. And it's really nice to be able to look at things up close. So again, this, this whole workshop is designed to give you some ideas of how to do that on your own. And uh, again, you can feel free to flip through this lesson packet and read through it at your own uh, convenience as well. So without further ado, let's get started with our warm up exercise. What we're going to be using is a piece of paper and a pencil. And we're gonna go through the, the foundational uh, drawing exercise that uh, all of the other hike and draw workshops are predicated on. And this is going to be something that we will be using a reference photo for, okay? So this is the reference photo. We're gonna be drawing a hoof fungus or a tinder fungus. And this is still something you can find out in the woods in the winter time all year round. And they are particularly fond of birch trees. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So if you have this reference photo handy, I'd encourage you to open that up in another window. You can find it in the chat or in the email that I sent prior to class. And I'm going to be sharing my top-down camera now. Okay. And here we see a couple of different items. So this is my baseline kit. This, these are the things that I always go hiking with no matter what. It's just a small field notebook. This is something that I have my field notes in, but uh, I, I like my mecha mechanical pencils because you can protect the tip from breaking. And also I have this nice little tin where I fit the rest of my kit. And again, it's just a backup mechanical pencil, a regular drawing pencil, about 2B softness, 
so as you know, drawing pencils come in different hardness, uh, hardnesses and softnesses. I haven't had my coffee yet. So if that, if that grammar isn't correct, I apologize. And I also like to have a, uh, a sepia colored pencil too. Uh, and then finally in my little kit, I like to include a felt tip pen. So this is part of my baseline kit. These are the things I like to use. So uh, in, in today's class, I'm mostly gonna be focusing on just using the uh, mechanical pencil, keep it simple. And I have a nice piece of regular white drawing paper here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna fold it in half, which I invite you to do as well. And this is a nice way to not only save paper, but also to um, also to be a little bit more organized on your drawings on your drawing area. And the first thing we're going to do for our exercise is create a margin or a frame. Okay, and I want to leave a little bit of room for notes because that's something that also helps to add a little bit more um, value and sentiment to your drawings. Okay, again, these are your artifacts or your um, kind of documentary process of your experiences out in nature. So if you want to be able to look back and, and also to share your experiences with, experiences with other people, it's nice to include notes. So the first thing I always like to include is the date. That puts a timestamp, right, on our drawing. So today is the 13th of February. I can't believe it's already halfway through the month. And the other thing I like to do is I like to write down the name of the object that we're drawing first, okay? So if you look at that reference photo, this is a hoof fungus because it looks sort of like a horse hoof. Okay, so that's H-O-O-F. Okay, and you don't have to, but the reason why I include the Latin name is because I particularly find it interesting. Um, I, I think it's nice to be able to communicate with fellow naturalists about different specimens, even if there is a language barrier, because universally, this is the term that this species is known by. So it's, a, um, it's pronounced fomus fomentarius, okay? T-A-R-I. U S. Okay. And it just kind of helps the drawing to have a little bit more um, relevant data. Okay. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to consider the size and proportion of this object. Okay. So again, uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to share my screen. This is the reference photo you should have open on your screen. And I'm going to give you some tips to add some texture and to make this seemingly boring object feel more interesting. Okay. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to consider the proportions of this object or how much space it occupies within this frame. All of this stuff in the background, we can add later. This is what we're going to be focusing on right now. Okay. So the first thing I do is I consider the height and the width. All right, and I want us to sort of approach this as if we were architects, okay? And the reason why is because an architect creates a blueprint and the blueprint is what enables the builders to build. So considering just the rough proportions here, I'm putting two little dots to indicate the height of the object. And I'm gonna put another two dots to indicate the width of the object. Now it doesn't have to be perfect. This is just sort of a estimation, okay? Because what I'm going to do within this sort of diamond shape is I'm going to construct step-by-step step the, the outline of the object. And I'm going to be doing that using dots, okay? So again, we're thinking like architects, we're going to basically do all of the hard work first, which is we're going to use this little dot system here to create an outline of the object, just like this. And the reason why we use dots to start this off is because it's the easiest form, it's the simplest form of mark making. Now, because this is 
very much a, it's not an exact science. It's something that you're going to have to train your eye on. It's okay if your object is a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller than you originally anticipated. That's fine. Okay, what we're going to be doing in our next step after we get our basic proportions defined is we're going to begin our drawing. Technically, this is still the planning process. We haven't really started drawing yet. Okay, and by tackling this first, what we're doing is we're getting all of the hard work finished, we're getting all of the dimensions and proportions squared away, so that when it does become time to draw, we're going to have not only a, an easier time of it, but it's also going to feel a little bit less stressful and it's going to be more fun. Okay, so we have this sort of blob on the page now. All right, now this type of a fungus. I mentioned uh, is particularly drawn to birch trees. So I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm going to include the area where the trunk is of the tree, okay? Now, why are these mushrooms, or, or why, are the, why is this species of fungus interested in birch trees? Well, birch trees contain a lot of sap. And if you've ever had a birch beer or birch syrup, Essentially, what you're, what you're consuming is the byproduct of this type of sap. It's very sweet. It's very sugary. And these, this species of fungus absolutely love it, okay? So what I'm doing right now is I'm going to use these dots as guidelines, and I'm going to not connect the dots because I don't think it's something that you need to so strictly adhere to. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm using these like guidelines and I'm giving myself an opportunity to actively edit, meaning this. If let's say, for example, I don't like the proportion or the shape that I did with the dots, I can just simply disregard that and maybe extend it a little bit with my line work. Okay, and now I'm giving myself an opportunity to make this more accurate a measurement than before. Okay, so as you can see, I don't have to trace the dots perfectly. I don't have to adhere to the proportions I put down perfectly. This is simply a way to get you started. Again, that's the whole point of the architect is to make the blueprints for the builder. Now that we have our blueprints down, we can start drawing by using this architecture as our guideline. Okay, so another name for this fungus is the tinder fungus. And the reason why is just like the namesake, you can use this, especially if you're a camper, as a way to start a campfire. Okay, so tinder is a ingredient in the fire building process. It's the most important ingredient in the fire building process because it catches a spark and produces an ember. And that ember, when applied correctly to the tinder bundle, will ignite a spark, which will then ignite a, a small fire. And then you add your kindling and then eventually you add your fuel. It's a very uh, input output type process. So in order to capture the roundness of this horse hoof, what I'm going to have to do is I'm gonna come back into my architecture rule again. And I'm just going to consider how this shape needs to be in order to feel round. Okay, and I'm just looking at that, that nice margin that exists. It's almost like different layers. And I'm seeing how they connect from point A to point B. And you can see this roundness. Okay, that's very important. That roundness is what's going to help to give us the correct shape. Okay, if you couldn't tell, I'm in New York City, so the sounds in the background might be a little distracting. I apologize. Okay, so this second part here, if we follow with our eye from the beginning of this rim to this one, we're going to see the same, um, the same shape, except there's going to be a nice little variation, almost like a wavelength, like a waveform, just like that. Okay, you don't have to do it perfectly, just, just enough to give it a little bit of character. Okay, now there's a little bit of a break here. And you're gonna notice that it sort of wraps around itself. So 
instead of this line completing itself from point A to point B, you're actually gonna have to travel up a little bit from here and work your way around to right here, all right? So this is a very subtle nuance. If you were to peel this top layer off, this is a very hard sort of shell, let's call it, that grows to protect the organism, right? It's basically like a clam that lives on a tree, except it's a fungus. So when you break this shell open or you peel this shell off, underneath you're going to be finding this beautifully um, soft amber type material that feels almost like velvet. And that's the stuff you're interested in if you wanna use this fungus for tinder, for starting a campfire, okay? Now, at this point, what we can do is we can start to get rid of some of these extra dots if they're feeling a little bit um, redundant. And if you like the way they look, you can totally keep them, that's fine. But for here, what we're going to do is just to tidy up the workshop a little bit, okay? I'm just gonna get rid of the dots that I do not need. All right, good. So now that I've done that, I'm gonna keep going. So we have one more layer, one more of these rings to use. Okay, you see a little chip right here and it continues all the way around to there from point A to point B. Great, so at this point, we have what looks like essentially a clam that's adhered to a sort of nondescript surface. So if you want, what we could also do is add a little bit more character to this object and make it feel more like it's more like it actually is. Okay, so I'm just gonna grab my 2B softness pencil here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider um, some of these textural elements and let me just go ahead and create the finished rings. Okay, and we see that there's a nice little texture that comes with this object. It almost feels like a leathery sort of look. Like if you've ever um, had a leather glove and those creases in the leather that, that, you, um, that you gain after much use, that's kind of what this texture reminds me of. Okay, so how do we get that kind of a texture? What we're going to do is we're going to suggest value, okay? And what that means, value in, in art terms, um, that is the relationship between light and dark, okay? So value is what's going to help us to create a texture. It's also what's gonna help us make this pretty non-interesting object more interesting visually, okay? So there are these nice little leather creases. We wanna keep those. There are these little areas here. And let's go ahead and finish this ring around the edge of the fungus. You know, I, I'd also mentioned earlier that I'm in New York City. This is like a nice little meditative way to sort of escape, <laughs> escape the city for a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and just acknowledge some of these other, other marks. Okay, so there's like a, a subtle cascading effect as we, as we start from the top and cascade our way down to the bottom. So how I'm going to go ahead and start shading this is um, kind of a two-step process. As you can see, my pencil is, has a sharp tip, okay? And that's not necessarily what I want. What I would like is a nice chisel tip on my pencil. So I'm gonna take a piece of scrap paper here and I'm just going to go ahead and wear my pencil tip down until it's the proper shape. And I'm just going to do this by making circles, okay? Very consistent, not pressing too hard, but you can see already that the tip of the pencil has this angle, this sharp angle to it. 
And that's very important for the shading process. The reason being is because when you have a flat surface and you rest it on top of another flat surface, what you're going to get is a nice even distribution of material. Okay, and the way I'm going to get this isn't by pressing very hard. Okay, I find the area that has the most shadow. Okay, and with my pencil, I'm going to just let the weight of the pencil rest on the paper. And very, very lightly, I'm not pushing hard at all. I'm going to create these little circles over and over and over again. It's a very meditative process, almost like a, a mandala. You're just following the same pattern very, very subtly. And it's important to feel that, right? That connection between this chiseled flat tip with the flatness of the paper. Otherwise, what you're gonna be getting are lots of little loops and you don't want that. If you're experiencing that right now, it might be because you're using um, a pencil that has a, uh, a harder type of material. So typically like the number two, two school pencils that we use are a pretty hard um, graphite material. And that's gonna give you a little bit of trouble. So you would be better off using a pencil that has a softer type of graphite. And the grading system which we, which we use, um, this is something that you'd see on, the, on, the package, on a package of art pencils. It, it usually starts with uh, the letter H and it goes all the way through to B and so on and so forth. So uh, this is about a 2B softness, which is what allows me to get this nice consistent texture without pressing that hard at all, okay? So considering this object as, as, it, as it is, right? It basically, again, it looks like a clamshell that's stuck on a tree. Um, this is a pretty interesting specimen because again, it's something that you can use as a camper to help ignite a campfire. And the process includes peeling off this outer shell and exposing that rich um, auburn sort of color, that amber color that um, the inner material is made out of, right? And that inner material is what you need to dry out and, uh, and shred a little bit in order for it to be ready to catch a spark and ignite uh, a tinder bundle, okay? So, as interesting as fungus is, <laughs> we're not gonna be spending too much longer on this. What we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be continuing this, um, this workshop with a couple of other exercises. And that will include a landscape as well as a, uh, a quick primer on speed sketching. And that's something we do in nature journaling, okay? The reason being is because nothing stands still in nature unless it's a plant or it's dead. So if you wanna be able to capture the things you're seeing around you quickly, you're gonna to have to sacrifice a little bit of accuracy for it, but you wanna think like a reporter and that's something we'll talk about in a little bit. So as we get closer and closer to um, each of these rib lines, okay, we need to consider that, that sort of texture again, like that leather glove texture and Something you can do to make the creases feel a little bit more accurate is you can use a series of dots and dashes next to a solid line, sort of like this. And what that's going to help you do is mimic that type of texture, okay? So let's go ahead and start making those little circles again. And notice how you're going to be seeing uh, areas that are darker, areas that are lighter. And the way we describe the relationship between the two, I had mentioned the term value before. Um, contrast is another art term you should be familiar with. And contrast is essentially those two values next to each other, the difference in those two values, okay? So over here, let's go ahead and continue building on this little this little area back here, it's gonna be a little bit darker. So I'm not gonna push harder on the paper to get a darker shadow. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm just pushing the exact same amount of weight, barely any at all, 
okay? And what that's helping me do is it's just adding another layer onto the base coat, right? So if we were painting and you were to add a base coat first and then another layer of paint on top of it, that's kind of the idea that we want to use with pencil. We want to put our base coat down first, like we're doing just now. And everything that goes on top of that base coat is going to give us a darker and darker and darker shade. So the areas that we're going to keep perfectly white are the areas that have the most light. Okay, so we're not going to have to use a, a white colored pencil or anything like that. We're just going to leave the page blank, essentially, and let the white of the paper act as the highlight for us. And also it's nice, once you shade in these areas, you can start, you can start seeing the spots that appear on the texture of the, of, the, uh, of the shell of this fungus. So that's something too that adds a little bit of character to your sketch as well, okay? And it could be a little bit time consuming, but that's okay. The whole point of this is to slow down and to be more observant of the natural world around you, right? So let's say you were hiking and you came across a, a, a beautiful flower or some type of animal relic, like a skull or something like that. You just go ahead and make yourself comfortable and start by using our step-by-step -step process or our architecture idea, right? Start by considering the height and the width of the object. Then you go ahead and you use your, your dots to create a profile or an outline of that same object, right? And that'll help get, get you started. And then once you get started, you can consider not only how the lines um, follow the guidelines, but you can also add another effect. Check this out. This is called line weight variation. So since we know the darkest part of the mushroom is underneath, what we can do is we can just use our pencil to create a darker line on the bottom, only on the bottom. And what this is going to do is help us suggest shadow. See the difference? Almost immediately. Same thing here. As these layers sort of come in, just make it a little bit darker, just like that, as, it, as they come in like this. So if I was following this cascade, it comes down and then in, I'll make that little line on the edge just so slightly darker, barely noticeable, but enough to give you a, a nice little extra layer of depth, a little bit more dimension there. Same thing where the, the um, fungus is connected to the tree. See how it bows out, bows out a little bit on this side? You can leave that lighter. Okay, but that gradual, that subtle change in line weight, and that's just, that's just a term that we use for the thickness or the darkness of the line, really comes, it really goes a long way in adding that nice subtlety and you don't want to do that all the way around. You just want to do it in areas that need it. And it creates such a nice, pleasing effect. Just like this. And you don't do it everywhere, again, because then that'll ruin the effect. But like little areas that are chipped out of the fungus like this. Check that out. Okay. So we're taking this seemingly banal object and we're, we're breathing new life into it. We're, we're making it more interesting just by giving it attention, just by this drawing is sort of a homage to a, a, a very unnoticed character. Now, speaking of characters uh, that are unnoticed, who's heard of Lotzi the Iceman? This is essentially a, a primitive human that was found mummified in ice or encased in ice, perfectly preserved almost, um, thousands and thousands of years, okay, in, in, in ice. And one of the objects that the archaeologists found on um, Otzi the Iceman was some of this tinder fungus. And that was the purpose, they believed, that uh, the reason why Otzi was carrying this mushroom, this uh, fungus, was because of its properties in fire making. Okay, so that technique of using this fungus as a tinder source is literally thousands and thousands of years old. 
And it's, it's incredible how over the course of millennia, we've gotten so far away from understanding what these little subtle things in nature are and why they're valuable. So during a tree's life, these are considered parasitic, okay? So these fungi attach themselves to trees like the birch and essentially leach nutrients. Now, after the tree dies, it, it switches roles. It, it stops being a parasite and it becomes a decomposer, right? So like all carbon-based organisms, once the, um, once the life is gone, the, the object breaks down and, and cycles back into, um, it goes back into what we call the carbon cycle. These fungi help that process by breaking down the dead wood of a tree and allowing it to re-enter the carbon cycle. So it's a very interesting and, and important member of the nature community. Okay, and um, it's, it's, a, it's just a nice thing to, to notice. The next time you're on a hike, see if you see any of these out there and then you can tell somebody you're with. Okay, so again, you wanna get that leather creased look, just add some dotted or dashed lines like this next to the solid lines and it'll help to create that crease. Just like that. And again, if there's an area that feels particularly bright, just leave the paper blank. That's totally okay. That'll get you the highlight. Okay, same thing up here. Since this is a little bit more shaded, again, if I wanna make it darker, I'm not gonna press hard. All I'm going to do is just add another layer of graphite using the exact same amount of pressure as before. Okay, see what happens? I'm not pushing down hard. It's not creating any issues with the paper. In fact, the tooth of the paper or the texture of the paper is essentially filling with graphite. That's, that's why this is an effective technique because the, the tip of the pencil, again, is chiseled tip. It's flush with the rest of the object, right? With the, rest, with, the, uh, with the paper, rather. And that gives us an opportunity to have a nice, consistent application of material here, all right? All righty. And this will repeat for the rest of the object, all right? So, what we're gonna do next, okay, and you can literally spend hours working on the same drawing. So we're gonna just cut this one a little bit short because we still have more to do. And if you're interested in doing this type of work, we have a nature drawing intro workshop once a month where we draw a nature object and also an animal or a bird. Okay, so it's an opportunity to learn a little bit more about these foundational drawing techniques and then apply them to both a nature object and a, uh, a wildlife reference. Okay, so this will continue until the rest of the object is finished, but we've gotten the foundation, we've gotten the, the technique. Okay, we have our line weight variation that we've added. Right, this helps to create, again, that nice, subtle, um, extra layer of depth here. Okay, you can go in and you can shade a little bit darker, not by pressing harder, but just by adding another layer on top of a base coat like we did before. Just like that, nice and consistent using a chiseled tipped pencil, nice flat edge, resting it squarely on the paper so that it's flat meeting flat, and then using very, very, very light pressure to create those circles, which will drive that material into the tooth of the page, just like that, okay? All right, and again, we could spend hours on this, all right? So for our next exercise, 
what we're going to do is share screens again. <clears throat> and we're going to now apply this system of drawing to a landscape, okay? Now, it's important to consider how to set up a landscape and, and we really give priority to what we're drawing by what we call establishing a visual hierarchy, okay? So I have another reference photo here and this is, a, this is something I emailed to everybody of a landscape and it's very nicely and conveniently framed by these branches, okay? And by the foreground. Okay, we have this nice picturesque mountain scene here in the winter. I felt like that was apropos. And this is something that gives us a basically pre-designed drawing. Because if we were hiking along, you know, it may not have occurred to us that we can use these hanging boughs as like a natural frame. Okay, this being the, um, the focus of the drawing. So if we were to establish a visual hierarchy, this would be on the top of the pyramid, so to speak, and everything else around is, settling, is setting up the scene so that this piece stands out the most, okay? So what we're gonna do is, again, we're gonna, we can, we're gonna put, a, put a pin in this one. We're gonna basically flip the paper over and we're going to draw another margin. And again, we're recording this workshop. So if there's anything you want to rewatch or um, spend a little bit more time on, you can use that recording as your resource, okay? And I encourage you, if you want to uh, share your drawing with me, you can send me an email at the end of class and I'll be happy to provide some tips and give you some advice, okay? So similarly to how we set up our nature object drawing, we're going to, again, put on our architect hats and we're gonna consider how we can use this frame as a tool. And that tool is going to help us measure. So we're looking at our landscape, okay? And might also help if I share the image here too just while we're talking through it. And since we have this margin, okay, that goes around the entire drawing, a frame, let's take a look at where things in this image enter the frame, okay? So for example, if I were to look in the upper left-hand corner of the rectangle I just drew, I'm going to see that around here, the bow of the tree enters into the frame. So it'll be useful if I add a little dot or a tick mark to let me know that's where the bow enters the frame. Same thing down here. Okay, if I were to look in the upper left-hand corner and I see a note where this little dot appears on the frame, it's a little bit almost halfway down the frame, that's going to help me set up my drawing. Another thing we can do is we can draw a line very, very lightly down the center of the screen down the center of our drawing. And that's gonna give us our, uh, our, our center vertically and horizontally. That could help too, okay? So that's like dividing your drawing into four corners or four quadrants. Because if you follow to the middle of this frame, you're gonna note that at least two inches of bow enter in from the top. So if it's an inch on either side from the middle, I can add a tick mark here and a little tick mark here. And then if I bring my eyes over to the upper right-hand corner, I'm gonna see how the tree comes in from the top, sort of cuts in a little bit, and then works its way around down to the bottom. And this whole bottom frame here, if we, if we start from the middle, and go up, it's about an inch and a half or so. So we can also draw a little dot or a mark here to give us an indicator of the tree line, right? And that's enough to get started. So what we have here is a frame with a lot of these little measurements 
okay? And that's us setting up our landscape in proportion using our margin as a tool, all right? Now let's keep going. If we go to the upper left-hand corner, what we can do is you can use the dots again, okay? And you can create a very, very rough outline of this tree bough that comes in and hangs from the upper left-hand corner. Okay, and it doesn't have to be neat, it doesn't have to be perfect, just enough for you to get a reference so that you can go ahead and when we get to the next step, follow the, um, the blueprint to begin your drawing. Okay, because again, this is like the, the, the setup of our drawing first. Same thing here. If we look at the top, all right, and see how it just sort of subtly hangs down. We're just, we just, we're interested in the volume here. We're not so much interested in the particulars just yet. We're just interested in the volume so that we have something to base the rest of our drawing on. Same thing, if we bring our eyes to the upper right-hand corner, the tree that's standing on the right-hand side is acting like a frame, okay? So we have this shape of the tree. And again, don't have to make it perfect, just enough so that we have the volume so that we know where it goes. It's actually gonna follow a pretty uniform uh, rhythm all the way down to where it gets closer to the frame on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Okay, and we have another little tree that's in front of it right now, but that's not so important. Let's talk about this tree line in the foreground. If we look on the bottom right-hand corner and work our way up, we're gonna notice that a tree appears from right around here, okay? And what we have are these, I'm assuming that they're spruce trees. And we can go ahead and make these little triangle references or dots just like this to create the bottom of our frame. Okay, if, uh, if, if this picture, if the visual hierarchy dictates that the mountain and that little sliver of lake is going to be the most important part of the drawing, then everything else is the natural frame, okay? And if you want, you can follow and see where this alpine ridge, okay, sort of follows suit with the rest of this system. Okay, so now we have our ridge. All this from just using a rectangle around our drawing as a measuring tool, okay? Now that we have the architecture in place, we can start our drawing, okay? So let's take off our architecture, hat, architecture hats and put on our artist berets. So how do we draw these types of trees? There are so many of them, and how do we even get started? The trick is not to draw every single tree individually, because that's gonna take you all day. What you're going to do instead is you're going to focus on a couple of, um, let's call them, uh, we're gonna focus on a couple of key characters so that we give the impression of what these trees look like in their entirety so that everything around them, we can use the power of suggestion to our advantage, okay? So if we focus here on, let's, let's look at that white tree that's covered in, in ice, okay? Somewhere around here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by putting a dot for the top of the tree, and I'm gonna put a dot for the bottom of the tree. I know we can't see the bottom of the tree, but because there's another tree in front of it, but this, this is what we need to do. One for the top and one for the bottom. You can also go ahead and look at the width of the tree and put two dots to measure the width of the tree. Now I'm not gonna draw a trunk. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a system of a series of dots and dashes to create the profile of the tree. And I'm not, as tempting as it is, I'm not going to draw the trunk yet, okay? Because then we usually wind up with what looks like a pipe cleaner and we don't want that. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm setting this up using that reference photo. My eyes are on the tree, they are on the reference and I'm giving it an, an outline first because that's very important when you're trying to create a silhouette. A silhouette is when an object is completely um, highlighted by 
its background, right? So since this is the one of the only trees covered with ice, this is not, we're not gonna color it in, right? We're gonna keep it white because it's covered with snow and ice and everything around it is green. So that creates a nice silhouette of this tree. Okay, and as we get closer to the bottom, we're gonna, we're gonna have other trees that pop up in front of it. So I'm just going to leave the shape of that other tree, right? And that's gonna be the contrast. That's gonna be a dark contrast to this light silhouette, okay? And here we have an outline. Now, what do we do with this outline? Instead of drawing a trunk from top to bottom, consider how the trunk is intermittently shown at different intervals, just like that. Okay, and then there are parts of the tree that cover entirely the center part, so you're not going to see the trunk there, which is good because it feels more realistic. We also have these branches that are alternating and you're not gonna see every single branch in the tree too. So in order to help sell the illusion of this tree, all I'm doing is I'm using dots and dashes to sort of suggest the needles that grow on these types of um, spruce trees or fir trees, depending upon what species we're looking at here. It's hard to tell. I think these are spruce trees, okay? So that's, how you, that's kind of how you start drawing trees, all right? But we don't have to draw every single one in the forest, okay? For example, we see that there are trees on this ridge line in the background. How do we draw those trees? Well, what we can do is sort of suggest them like this in the distance. And then as you get closer to the top of the mountain, the trees sort of level off a little bit. Okay, and then the ridge line continues. Think about it like a, uh, like a heart rate monitor or a Richter scale. Okay, you're just creating this sort of suggestion Okay, and because of the work that you did in the foreground, the person looking at this drawing is gonna be able to look at your landscape and say, aha, these are the same as these, they are trees. And that's the power of suggestion that art authors and, and artists and any type of creative person get to attain after a lot of practice. Okay, it kind of casts that spell on the audience in a very subtle and romantic way. All right, so now what about this lake? The lake is somewhere in here. We only see a tiny sliver of it. We're not seeing too much of the lake. So in order for us to finish this foreground, what we're gonna do is something similar to what we did back here. We're going to go and we're gonna start just like we did with this tree here, we're going to start by just noticing how the tree is growing. It's alternating arrangement, so to speak, or world arrangement. I'm not sure what species of tree that is, but when I say alternating, I mean that they're not perfectly symmetrical. Okay, that's actually very helpful for us as the artists. So we're gonna create a sil uh, an outline of this group of trees rather than each individual tree in the forest. Again, because it just takes forever and you don't need to do that in order to get the effect. Okay. And just using dots and dashes, leaving a lot of white space. You want a lot of room for the imagination. You know, the brain's a very powerful and interesting thing and it, it finishes the job for you. You know, it's like that idea when, when you complete somebody else's sentence because you already know what they're gonna say. Okay, the brain fills in the blanks. It looks for patterns. It's designed to look for patterns or it's evolved to look for patterns. Again, you don't have to draw the whole trunk, just sections of the trunk. Okay, but we're not focusing on just one tree, we're focusing on the entire forest at once. Okay, so this is what's going to help us to draw a hundred trees in a tenth of the time. Just like this. Nice 
open. You want it to have air. You want the trees to breathe a little bit. You don't want them to feel like they're so tight and rigid. Okay, and you're just gonna keep going. You're, you're gonna follow this ridge line or this, uh, this tree line, treating the entire forest as a singular body. And that way you're going to be able to get a lot of work done in a very short amount of time. Okay, here's where the lake starts to show up. Okay, so we have a little area here and then a bigger tree like right around here. Okay, I'm just gonna follow the outline of the tree. It doesn't have to feel neat. It doesn't have to feel orderly. It just has to feel like a tree. Okay. And now we have this other area, right? Here's the lake, here's the lake. And we have this other tree right here, just a little bit, it's tall enough to block the view a little bit. Not tall enough to obscure it completely though, which is good. Okay, there's the rest of the lake. Okay, and now we have the other trees. Okay, we're gonna to get to a group of trees that's just a little bit taller. Okay. Say they're around this tall actually. So even though my estimate earlier was a little bit off, right? See how small I made those trees? They're actually up here. Because I'm using that dot system, it doesn't really matter that I uh, measured that my measurement was slightly off. I just remeasure and actively edit so that it's pleasing to me and that it, it's accurate and uh, it works. Just like this. Okay, you're drawing not the individual tree, you're drawing the group as a whole. Okay, now we got to the point where we reached this other tree here, this big one on the side. So I'm just gonna pause and I'm gonna look inside here before we move on to that next part and try to find some more characters that we could identify. Now, there's a small group of lighter trees right in here that we can go ahead and experiment with. So draw a dot for the top, draw, uh, draw a dot for the base and just kind of create that silhouette and look how much space is between each of these marks too. And I'll zoom in my camera a little bit so you can see that a little bit more clearly. You know, there is a ton of space in between these marks here. Okay, so following, following the idea that these trees are airy, that they have room to breathe, will help them to feel more realistic because again, the brain fills in the rest of the pattern. The brain will identify this as a tree. Okay, and I use this really silly example. So if you've ever seen somebody draw a tree like this, you know, or uh, this, or my absolute favorite, this, and you can't forget the squirrel hole. We know that these are trees, right? They don't look like trees, but they are similar enough that they act like icons of trees. So these are figurative representations of tree, right? So if people will know based on what they've seen in life that these are trees, the same principle applies here. See how right now this looks nothing like a tree, um, but when it's in the context of other things like a nature scene, then the brain identifies it as tree and you get to draw an entire forest using a couple of symbolic representatives of what trees are and the brain fills in the rest. It's incredible. Okay, just like this little group of trees right here. Check them out. They're just huddled up together because it's all frigid and cold here in the Northland. All right, and they get to hang out together, just like that, okay? So then, 
essentially what you would do is you would consider the fact that these are going to be lighter than the background. So the back, these, these trees would be darker than these trees if you were to color them in. Same thing over here. We have another bush or tree. It's not a, it's not a fir tree. It's a different kind of tree. So we're going to have to tackle it a little bit differently, but the same principle applies. You're going to have a tree-like object in this corner here. That's probably like a birch or a, maybe a maple or something. Okay. And you got, if you go in too deep, it's going to get complicated. So you just want to keep it simple and, and give it a strong neighbor to stand next to. That's another trick. Like if you are going to go ahead and draw something like that, you're going to have to go ahead and, okay, one dot for the top, one top dot for the bottom. You're going to have to give it a strong anchor, all right, so that it doesn't get washed away by the imagination. You want to have something that's tangibly identifiable as a tree. So that way the mind will associate this with this or this. Okay. Cool. So this is how you draw a forest without every single tree, without having to render every single tree. Okay, and, and you could spend hours and hours and hours doing this, but you really don't have to. Okay. Let's just, for good housekeeping purposes, I just want to fill this in a little bit. There we go. Okay. Now, what about these hanging boughs? Now, these are a little bit more complicated because what this is doing is it's giving us um, something that we need to be a little bit more specific about, but it's not going to be too hard. Okay, we just got to pay a little bit of attention here to the structure of the thing so that it comes off as a, as a tree bow and not some kind of a flying mop. Okay, so all I'm doing is I'm following my reference very closely. Okay, and, it, and these shapes sort of remind me of gloves or mittens or fingers. And I'm just following the way it grows naturally. Okay, to the very end right here, the tiny little thumb. And I'm using lots of little dashes in order to get that, that needle effect. I want them to look like needles. because the foliage on these trees are very needle-like. They're not like pine needles that are very long and thin and fine. These are shorter, broader, more like a, a leaf than a needle, but still pointy nonetheless. Okay. And once you get the hang of it, you don't have to go as closely to the real life object as, you know, you don't have to be as literal is what I'm trying to say. And it gives you a little bit of room to, to wiggle. So that just like the forest, you don't have to draw every single branch on this bow. Draw the bow as an object of its, into, onto itself. And that'll give you an opportunity to cover more ground faster. Okay, wow. Time really flies. We have about 25 minutes left. So at the end of class, I usually, um, I, I let the video render, which takes a little bit of time, but I post the video so you can rewatch it. And I also send you the lesson packet and I'll put my completed sketches in that lesson packet for your reference as well. So at the end of the month, we do have a landscape drawing class. And I was asked by one of our students to focus more on trees. So kind of using this as an opportunity to warm up on drawing trees a little bit. But if you're more interested in drawing landscapes than you are nature objects or animals, that's a great class for you. It's another intro level class. We go through the same system of building a landscape together. And last time we did a desert landscape and the time before that we did an, um, an alpine lake 
landscape. So if you want to sign up, what you can do is uh, I'll, I'll include a bunch of links in the after class email. That's our schedule for the rest of the month. And you can click on those links, which will take you over to our Eventbrite page. And all of our classes are posted, all of our live classes are posted on Eventbrite. So if you happen to have a different schedule, you live in a, in a tricky time zone, um, what we do is after we record these workshops, I'm actually in the process of finishing this. I've built and, I am con and I'm now testing a website where I've uploaded some of the recordings. I'm going to be uploading recordings every single month to this website, but it's basically a video archive of our workshop. So if you can't make the live classes, which are on Eventbrite, you can subscribe to our website and you can access all of the recordings for less than the cost of a full pizza. <laughs> New York City pizza, of course. Okay, so here is a bow, all right? Now, same thing applies to this section here. Okay, and sometimes it's cool to draw little holes, little needle holes like this in, in between the trees. It just kind of gives it a realistic feeling like there's space in between the branches a little bit. Do that sparingly though. Same thing up here, like a little, little pinhole goes a long way. Okay, now let's go ahead. And I also wanted to point this out. Now the shore, the distant shore of this lake, okay? We gotta give it more than just a line to sell the idea. So just like we did on the top of the ridge line, let's do that along the lake, the shore of the lake, just like this in the distance. And what this does is it just, it just sells the illusion. It just gives us a more realistic shoreline. Okay, and if you wanna go into the water a little bit, just use some dots like that. And it gives it something else to work with here. Maybe you can even shade it in a little bit, or if you're using color, you can color it in a little bit there, just helps. And if you're interested in drawing the whole forest on the mountain, well, I'm sorry for you, but that's okay. I get those urges too sometimes. Um, you can go ahead and use little dots like this. So at this point, um, what I'm currently offering are, are mostly drawing with pencil classes. I have though been working really hard on getting better at color pencil. And when I get to the point where I feel good enough, I'm gonna be offering color pencil workshops. I know that that's a hot ticket item, but I, I love it. It's, it's just, it's a very time consuming process. And it's something that I wanna get truly masterful at before I offer a class in um, just color pencil but it's something that's on my radar. It's something I am working towards. And hey, I just don't wanna waste anybody's time. You know what I mean? If it's, if it's something that you're gonna come in and feel good about, then, that's, then I did my job. Okay, but the botanical drawing class, that's something we do. It's a, it, that's a, a marriage between art and science. It's a very uh, interesting class for people who are interested in gardening, people who are interested in learning more about the, the plant species. I did a little spiel on the, the horse hoof fungus when we started this workshop. Now, I usually focus on flowering plants or trees for botanical drawing. Um, it's something that I became interested in as a wilderness guide because I'd be leading hikes and one of my clients or several of my clients would inquire about what the different trees were. And I had no idea, which felt a little bad, you know, because as a, as a wilderness guide, you wanna be able to give information, accurate information to your clients. So I had reached out to another guide who is a good friend of mine, his name's Carrie Russell. And he sort of took me under his wing. He's, he's a master naturalist. He also used to work for the US Forest Service. So he's, he knows his trees. 
And uh, he gave me a little bit of an education on that and gave me some great books to read and some, um, he even took me on hikes and showed things to me firsthand, which I, I really, really enjoyed. Um, and that's something that I've wanted to bring to my students as well. So we talk about the trees, we talk about what they do and uh, where they're from, and we also draw them very accurately. And we include actual scientific data in those classes. So they're very fun. Um, it, it, it requires a lot of research on my end, which I do enjoy doing, but the information you're getting there is, is absolutely fact-checked and all of those references are included in the lesson packet. And if you're interested in plants specifically and you wanna learn more about that, I, I absolutely recommend the Botanical Drawing Workshop next week. We'll be doing the mountain laurel. Reason why I picked the mountain laurel is because of their beautiful flowers in the springtime. And I know we're in the middle of winter right now, but I just miss looking outside and seeing flowers. So it's an evergreen tree. So they have foliage right now, but the flowers aren't there yet. So I figured it would be a great opportunity to introduce somebody to a, um, to introduce the students to an evergreen tree um, that also flowers. So they can look out for it in the springtime. Rhododendrons are similar as well. They, they are also evergreen trees that have beautiful flowers. Okay, so there's the other silhouette of the bow. Finally, let's go ahead and finish up this tree on the right. Um, I'm also noticing there's a little bit of a contrast, right? of the trees on this mountain. So if you're interested in creating a little bit more contrast, just consider the formula, right? For drawing trees out in the distance, but create little blocks of them, just like this. Okay, just like this. They almost look like little countries on an atlas from this far away, but. Okay, and you can get as involved in the background as you want. If you feel like it's feeling a little bit too blank over here, definitely get in there and play with some texture just like this. Very, keep the space, you know, and if you feel like it, things aren't looking the way you want them to look, feel free to erase, that's totally fine. Okay, final part, let's get over here. We have about 15 minutes left and we still have one more exercise. <laughs> so I'll begin talking about that um, final exercise now since time is of the essence. This next exercise that we're about to do is a speed drawing or a field drawing exercise. I was guiding a trip down in the Brazilian Amazon last year prior to the pandemic. And in that trip, I was a student. I was like a, uh, an apprentice guide. So I wasn't doing all the, the expert heavy lifting stuff like uh, the master guide was, but I was there as, as an observer and as a, as a kind of apprentice. And during that time, I brought my, absolutely brought my sketchbooks with me, but everything started, it was just so fast. Everything moved in and out so quickly. So I developed a technique to, or at least a training tactic to get my note-taking skills down, my visual note-taking skills a little bit more sharp. And that's the idea. We talked about being an architect this whole time. And now I'm gonna introduce another persona for you to adopt. And that's of the reporter, the natural history reporter. And the object of this persona is to get as much information down on the page as possible as much visual and also you can use notes like written notes as well. As much information down on the page as possible because the moments are fleeting and they're and you need to get that information down or it's lost, you know? Um, not everybody is very good with a camera or maybe you do have a camera but your batteries died or something. It's always good to have this skill ready for your use. And even though we're not going to be putting as much effort into laboring over a drawing like we are with our landscape here, what we are going to be able to do is come back with information about what we just saw, okay? 
That's what visual note taking is all about. You want to use icons, you want to use notes, you want to use very rapid and loose sketches in order to report back what you've seen and a couple other data points, which we'll learn about in a minute. But yeah, that, that was an amazing time. I can't wait to go traveling again. I know everybody feels the same. <laughs> okay, just coming around here and finishing up this silhouette of a tree. It looks like there's two. It looks like there's the darker tree in the foreground and then a lighter tree slightly behind it. But since it's such a pronounced profile, I, I feel like it's important to include. Okay, maybe we bring the darker tree back here a little bit just so we can differentiate between the two. All right, so as we go in here, we can add a couple of different layers, some more branches, kind of use the lessons we applied over here with the boughs to, since we're looking at a tree more closely, we're actually seeing boughs, get those sort of hanging glove-like shapes in the picture. Okay, and it's very dark and silhouetted in here, so we can add some pinholes just like that, or you can shade it in entirely. It's up to you, but it's always nice to leave a little space in the picture for your signature. Okay, so that's the basics of landscape drawing. And again, if you're more interested in, in really diving deep and having a full 90 minutes of landscape drawing, definitely check out our Eventbrite page and also the link I'll send you in the email and uh, feel free to sign up, okay? On to the next one. We have, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, it's kind of nice that we have less time because we'll actually have a sense of urgency to complete this exercise. Okay, here we go. Final exercise. We're going to play a memory game. Okay, and we're going to have to set up our paper in order to play this game correctly. But the idea is to include things like icons, notes, rapid sketches, because you're a natural history reporter and you need to get down as much information on the paper as possible about what you're seeing while it's happening, okay? And this is something we do in our nature journaling workshop, which you'll also find on the Eventbrite page, okay? So how do we set up our paper? What we do is we draw a rectangle, just like before. I'm gonna use the exact same piece of paper, but notice in this, um, in this very, very rough and loose page, we're seeing a couple of different things. You know, the, the pictures aren't great, but the information's there. We're, we're, we're recording things like date, location, time, weather, temperature, uh, what types of things we're seeing. We're writing down questions that we have. We're, um, we're giving descriptors. We're creating a, a narrative out of a bunch of different images and they're just called thumbnails. That's the, that's the term we use for low fidelity, rapid sketching, rapid sketches. Those are called thumbnails, okay? So we're gonna start by setting up our paper just like this. And let me just adjust my camera so you have a better view here. Just like before, what we're gonna do is we are going to um, essentially start by creating a margin. Okay, you can start to see that this is a theme in my classes, the, the margin here. Okay, so now that we have our paper set up and we have our margin, what we're going to do is divide this singular rectangle by <clears throat> going from top to bottom. So we have two frames now. And what we're gonna do is create a fourth, one, two, three, four different boxes. So I had mentioned the use of data, okay? What we have here is, um, okay, we have our date, which is the 13th. And let's go ahead and say that we're all on a hike together right now. And since it's the winter, I picked a bunch of different winter themes. So if we were gonna be somewhere cold, let's say we were in um, maybe Maine, Northern Maine or, or Vermont. Let's pick Vermont. It's a very classic American winter 
wonderland. So if we were in Vermont, um, you know, we would say that, okay, we are in, let's make up a park name. Or if anybody is from Vermont and they have a good example of, uh, of a great hiking location, you can put that in the chat. But for all intents and purposes, let's, uh, let's call it um, Birch Lake. Birch is a type of tree, just like we saw the fungus. So Birch, B-I-R-C-H, Lake. And the initials of Vermont is just V-T, okay? So immediately we've alerted the world that we have uh, on, the Feb on February 13th, 2021, we were at Birch Lake, Vermont. That's the beginning of our narrative, okay? So now let's go ahead and take a look at this box right here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to challenge you and your memory, and I invite you to lay your pencils down, put your hands on top of the page, and you're going to look at a video for 15 seconds. Then the video is going to go away. And from memory, you're going to put in this little box using words, icons, or images what you saw. Okay, again, we're thinking like natural history reporters here. So we're going to test our memories. I'm going to give you 15 seconds to look and then 15 seconds, or actually I'll give you 30 seconds to um, 30 seconds to draw. So get ready, keep your hands on your desk, pencils down, and we'll begin observing in three, two, one. Okay, well, that didn't work. Let me try that again. What are you hearing? What are you seeing? How cold do you think it is? What type of species of tree is this? What type of berries are they edible? What do they taste like? These are all questions that a natural history reporter might be asking right now, okay? And just like that, video's over, what did we see, okay? So from memory, all right, let's go ahead and focus on this little box right here. Okay, so the first thing I felt was the wind, right? So I heard the wind, so let's just say the weather, the environmental conditions were um, windy. And let's say the temperature was, because the ice was melting, let's say the temperatures were 34 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so that's our first bit of data. Now we have these berries that are encased in ice. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm just doing this from memory here, but I'm gonna say, I'm gonna actually write red berries. And we're just sketching them very quickly. You know, you don't have to get it perfect. And then you're going to have a, a little branch here, but what's interesting about the branch and the berries is that they're encased in ice. Okay, so. Okay, so some of the questions we had about these berries were, are they edible? Can you, can you eat them? Are they poison? What do they taste like? Okay, for people, I don't, I don't recommend just popping things in your mouth, but you'd be surprised how many things are edible in nature. And even if you don't swallow it, it's just not a good idea to just pop things in your mouth without knowing what they are. So taste would only be recommended for people who know their, know their stuff. <laughs> I don't want anybody to accidentally eat sumac berries and come back looking like a chipmunk, you know? <laughs> um, what's another thing? Is it overcast? It's, win it's winter after all, so maybe it's uh, overcast. The same okay. Time? Yes. Question. No? I thought I heard somebody call my name. Okay. So that's the first frame in our narrative. Okay. So Let's go ahead and, and just really quick, I'm gonna share my screen again. And I'm gonna also share some of the questions I had that I didn't write down. Okay, so here's an example of immediately the types of questions that came into mind. Okay, and in a very short amount of time, you focused on something that you may not have otherwise noticed. You've given something more thought and consideration than you would have done in any other circumstance. You know, you might have even noticed that there are little buds on the ends of these trees that could help you to identify what type of tree that is as well. 
Okay, so those are that's a, that's an example of this type of exercise. So now that we've got that down, let's do it again. I know we're running out of time. So sorry if you guys are if you have to run. Thank you for coming. Um, I'll be sending a follow up email at the end of class. So let's go ahead and we're going to allocate this space here. Okay, for this next exercise. And this time you don't have to have your pencil down. You don't have to have your hands on the desk. I invite you to draw and write as the clip plays. Okay, so we're going to begin that in three, two, and one, go. Okay, so same thing. We're looking at snow falling from trees, snow melting. Uh, we have a nice river. Okay, which direction is the river flowing? You can actually put a little directional arrow there. Okay, is it a fast moving river or, or stream? Um, you know, there are a lot of different trees on the riverbank. Are there any ones in particular that you know the names of? Like, is there swamp oak or birch trees, different types of um, trees that enjoy or are able to survive in soil that has low oxygen levels? Okay, how deep is the snow? That's another thing you can ask. Okay, and then there's, I see that there's a larger tree line in the background. Is that a mountain back there? What's the elevation of that hill? Okay, so at this point, go ahead and put your pencil down and let's take a look. What do we have? So on my little thumbnail here, what I did was I, put a little arrow for the direction of the stream. So we have a quick flowing stream. Okay, and this only took what, like 45 seconds, maybe 30 seconds top tops. So we have like a swamp oak over here. There's some elevation in the background. I noticed the snow was melting, right? Now, if this is all considered part of the same story here, let's go ahead and see what happens when we fill in the rest of these two boxes. Because what we are doing is we're creating a narrative based on our original timestamp and location. These are all things that are a part of the same narrative. So if you keep a nature journal, you're able to do these rapid sketches in under two minutes and get quite a bit of information down on paper to share with other folks later, especially if you have questions, okay? Another thing you could ask is where is the stream flow to? You can check on a map and maybe pinpoint it on a map. That's another type of workshop we have for our hiking skills. All right, we've got two minutes left. I know we can do this. <laughs> okay, so there is the, there's what we saw. So let's do another one. And you can do this. You don't have to go out into nature. You can have, you can just step out into your backyard. The first thing I notice here are footprints in the snow or tracks. Okay, we see that what looks like a, a nice fresh snowfall. And honestly, I love that we have uh, snow in the Northeast because that helps me to identify what animals are out and about while they are um, active in the winter time. Cause you know that some animals hibernate and other ones don't. So I would ask what types of tracks that we're seeing here. You know, the types of trees that we're seeing, these might be apple trees or pear trees. So I could just quickly say, um, you know, from top to bottom here, we have a grove of different trees. Maybe they're cherry trees. Nah, they're probably apple or uh, pear trees. Okay. And again, you can talk about the weather. It's an overcast day. What time is it? It looks like sunset. So you can say overcast at sunset. And what time is sunset? Let's say it's 5.30 p.m. Okay. So now we're giving ourselves a little bit more information here. And that information is about the sunset. When's the day end? When's daylight go? You know, and that's something that's interesting because if you do that every day, you'll be able to, and, and I know this information is available to look up on the internet now, but you'll be able to have a record of when the sun comes up, when the sun comes down, what the weather cycle is like without even having to draw a single picture. All right, and I know we're right out of time here, so let's go ahead and finish strong. Let's do one more rapid sketching exercise. This is next to a highway. Okay, and what do we see? We have tracks in the snow with green vegetation popping up. 
Okay. What else do we see? Okay. Let's pretend this is right around the same time. So we see the sky is a bit orange. So that means we're probably at the end of the day here. Okay. And we have a lot of these nice deciduous looking trees that lost their foliage, probably a mixture of oak and maple. Maybe even some birch in there as well. We can go closer and inspect that. But I just think it's interesting to know this. Despite that, the fact that the ground is covered in snow, so many little animals make this area their habitat. They call this the subnivian. The subnivian are where the different voles and, uh, and, and, and ground dwelling creatures live in the snow during the winter time. And foxes will often be seen jumping on top of that snowpack, trying to break through and pounce with, um, because they have excellent hearing um, on top of their targets. Okay, so just really quick to share my camera with you. We have our full narrative drawn at breakneck speed. Most of it is notes, but that's the whole point. We're natural history reporters with our nature journals. We're trying to get as much information down as possible. Okay, so let's go ahead and just take a look at what we did this class. We have our nature object and we did our drawing uh, system. We showed you how to think like an architect, how to find proportion, how to use your dot system to create a matrix in order to make a blueprint. And then we draw on top of that. And then we shade and add line weight variation. We, draw it our, we drew our landscape using our margin as our measuring tool. This gave us an opportunity to set up our um, our landscape accurately, okay? And we, were, we learned how to draw entire forests without having to focus on every single individual tree. But we also learned how to draw individual trees as well. And then finally, we finished with our rapid field sketching exercise, okay? So quick announcements really quick before everybody goes. Um, again, this whole thing is inspired to help you do this on your own out in nature, right? So make hiking or nature meditation or just going outside more often a part of your daily or weekly routine. If you're interested in something specific, read up on it, become a subject matter expert and then teach people what you've learned. A great way to keep all of your drawings in one place is to start a nature journal. This is something I really love. And if you're interested in joining a group of nature loving artists who like to share their work with each other, um, you can go ahead and check out our Facebook group. It's facebook.com slash group slash hike and draw. And it's a wonderful community. Um, the membership is totally free. And uh, we have once a month um, socials where we draw together for fun. We, um, I'll, po I'll post discounts to our live workshops and you'll also get announcements and all of that stuff first um, as, a, as priority. And it's just a great place to share your work and to get inspired. So I encourage you to join. I have some recommended reading, which you can flip through on your own. Uh, these are books that helped inspire me in my nature drawing practice. That's why I recommend them. And if you're interested in joining, joining some more of our live workshops, this is the rest of the schedule for February. You can find this on our Eventbrite page. Our website right now, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm still working on it. I'm testing it. Hopefully it'll be live next week. And uh, that way you'll be able to access the recordings in the archive as well. So thank you so, so much. I apologize for going over a little bit, but I loved having you today. It was so much fun getting to draw and share my knowledge with you. If you'd enjoyed it, feel free to leave a tip. I'd very much appreciate it and uh, share what you've learned with other people. And I hope to see you again in class real soon. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you, Jim. You're very welcome. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Hope to see you all again soon. Thank you.